Welcome to a ChemCon interview on UK Reach, again in a virtual setting, but with the same ingredients. Talking about ingredients, Marco Mensing from Cephic said about Brexit, it's like unraveling an omelette back into eggs. On Reach, I would say, let's unravel the omelette into British scrambled eggs. Chef industry does not seem to have an appetite to make another dish, but I'm confident that industry can prepare this. To get a taste of what we can expect, we will discuss UK Reach with Nishma Patel, Policy Director at CIA, and James Dancy, Head of UK Reach Service and Policy at DEFRA. Welcome. James, what are the key ingredients of UK Reach? Okay, thanks, Cheers. Um, yes, yeah, so UK Reach came into force in the UK um, on the 1st of January um, this year. Um, I mean, basically, it is the same as EU Reach. Um, but it's modified uh, for the UK context. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, authorization and restriction processes um, will remain the same, um, albeit some of the some of the decision making processes um, are modified for for a UK context rather than working with the EU. Um, and the same applies for for registrations. Um, you know, we are requiring the same information um, as EU Reach um, for registrations. We'll be using our Euclid software, for example. Um, and again, albeit there are some um, challenges around uh, the existing registrations, which I'll come to come on to in a second. Um, one point to make also is that uh, UK Reach um, only applies in the GB context. So that's for the England, Wales, uh, and Scottish um, markets. Um, obviously, Northern Ireland. Uh, at the moment remains within EU reach um, as part of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so as I focused on, one of the key issues of being UK reach in um, was how to sort of minimize, minimize disruption um, to supply chains uh, and make sure that you know, a lot of the trade between the UK and the EU and elsewhere is maintained. Um, so, you know, registrations is one of the biggest challenge. Um, so what's, what we have done is we've made sure that um, all existing uh, UK-based EU reach registrations were um, still valid and legal in the UK on the 1st of January, so there was no disruption there. Um, but then, obviously, as a UK regulator, we would want um, all the information underpinning um, those those reach or uh, registrations um, for UK regulators. Um, so there's therefore a phased process um, for companies to provide us um, with the information we are uh, the UK regulators uh, need. Um, one of the first deadlines um, are for um, existing UK-based EU reach registrants um, who have 120 days from the 1st of January um, to provide us with some initial information so we know who they are, um, the chemicals they're using, and some basic information. Um, so I said they've got 120 days. And then, of course, in the UK, there are importers in the UK who previously wouldn't have had obligations of EU reach because they were um, moving chemicals around within the EU. Um, but as they are now importers, uh, they now have a duty um, to register for UK reach as well. Uh, and they have 300 days from the 1st of January. So that's up until the 28th of October this year. Uh, again, to provide us with some initial information. Um, so that, again, we know who they are and what the chemical substances are they're using. Um, from that point forward, we would then want um, all those registrations to start to get together in joint registrations, uh, much as has been done within EU Reach at the moment. And then from the 28th of October, there are a further three uh, phased deadlines um, for companies to provide UK authorities with, with the full data package underpinning those chemical substances. Um, so two years from the 28th of October would be for uh, 1,000 tonnes um, plus. Um, for the four-year deadline, uh, would be 100 tonnes or more, and then the six-year deadline would be one tonne or more. Again, they echo um, those, those deadlines provided in um, EU reach. So that is the main initial challenge. But as I said, we tried to you know, minimise disruption by making sure those registrations are still valid. Um, and then UK reach, as I said, will look very familiar um, to EU reach with regard to you know, its, its day, daily workings um, from, from that point forward. Okay, thank you very much. UK REACH makes, of course, the distinction between registrations held by GB-based entities, eh, including other representatives that are grandfathered, and importers of substances from EU-based registrants that need to submit down to user import notifications. This grandfathering for companies, they, they don't have to pay a registration fee. 
That's right. Um, yeah, we, we've allowed them. They have already paid a registration fee once the EU reach. Um, so we deemed it was only only fair for them not to have to pay again um, for, for, the, for, the, for the UK or GB market in this case. Um, obviously, those downstream users have not had those obligations before. Um, so therefore, a registration fee was deemed appropriate in that, in that situation. Nishma, do you see that as a level playing field for industry? The fees issue is um, a key one, Jed. I think um, you have to look at it as a whole in terms of the UK market and not just for, for existing registrations that were registered under, under EU reach, but also for new registrations. So that would be new substances coming onto the market or indeed new registrants looking to register again for, for existing substances as well. So we have to look at level playing on, on that whole sort of broad, um, broad area, if you like. Um, the exception, as you say, is for those um, GB-based registrations, which will be grandfathered, if you like, and there, and there will be no fee there. But for the rest, for the rest of any registration coming into the UK, the fee under UK reach is up to £22,000, equivalent to what is under, under EU reach and, and ECA fees as well. So that's the same fee giving you access to one market opposite 30 markets if you include the EEA countries. So a big, big difference in, in the market you are you are able to access based on those, those costs. If you add to this, the it's well now recognised that supply chains are complex, um, they're integrated, but also they try to stay in close clusters. So you're not moving goods from, from across the world. You try and try and have it as, as closely connected as, as possible. So if you are a business looking to invest in the market, looking at putting new products on the market and your return on investment, one of the key things you'll be looking at is how competitive and how much market access will I be getting for my, for my product. So that's, that's a key issue to, to consider. I think the other one is around looking at other reach like legislations. So if we look across the globe, um, other, other countries which, and jurisdictions which implement a reach like legislation, and are comparative to say the UK market, their fees are a, a, a lot lower, up to 1500 per substance. So I think the level playing field issue is around between the UK and other jurisdictions and how competitive are we to allow new chemicals, new products and new innovations to come to the UK market. Okay, I, I heard about a very creative solution there that uh, uh, for UK companies that 25 UK industry associations and downstream user groups are currently pleading that UK companies, which already got an EU registration in place, should not have to provide full data packages in their UK reach dossier. Um, what is CIA's view on this? So um, the proposal you, you talk about, I, it, it's, it's nothing new as such. I think that some of the challenges and issues we, we've raised are, are, are not new to in terms of UK reach, um, in particular the duplication of, of existing registrations. And around that, the key issue, of course, is the cost to, of, of data and, of course, the UK reach fees we've, we've just mentioned as well. Um, yes, there, there, there is a proposal that has been signed by, by a number of bodies. Um, CIA has, has, has who's been involved with that and been working on the, the proposals, um, not just on that one, but many other proposals, which are essentially looking to minimise the burden um, of UK reach with industry. It's looking to recognise the work that's been done so far. And rather than water down any standards or deregulate, it's looking to build upon the investment made in over the last decade. So a number of proposals there that we're discussing with government um, the work, and we'll continue to work with government on um, and We'll see where we end up with on progress. Okay, from a European perspective, I wonder if this is a famous example of the UK having its cake and eating it, but let's see. Um, James, in their request, these industry groups are asking UK authorities to rely on basic and publicly available information for a large majority of the notified substances, enabling authorities like you to take a risk-based approach by only requiring companies to present full data sets for chemicals deemed to be of concern to the UK. Is this a pragmatic approach? Um, I think, as, as Nishma said, I mean, the, the issue that um, industry have, have flagged um, to government, um, I mean, said, as Nishma said, this is not a new issue. Um, we've been aware for, you know, for a long time um, that there are potential costs to industry of um, accessing um, data um, for UK reach purposes, um, you know, we have talked with the industry for um, you know, a, a long time around what, how we might mitigate those, some of those potential costs. Um, one of those was um, actually the UK government had a proposal um, in the chemicals annex, the technical 
barriers to trade chapter of the um, UK EU um, trade and cooperation and trade agreement um, that looked at potential data sharing between the UK and the EU, which potentially could have could have mitigated some of those needs for that data. Um, unfortunately, that was something that the EU side didn't wish to engage on. Um, so again, being aware of these costs, um, as I've already spoken about, we have already put in place a sort of staggered phase deadlines to providing data to us. Um, those were previously a, a strict two-year deadline for all substances, but we, we extended that um, last year to the two, four, and six-year deadlines I've talked about. So we've we've already making making efforts to try and um, you know, try and mitigate or spread those costs and allow industry more time to talk to each other um, to come sort of fair and equitable equitable agreements um, you know, with regard to sharing of that data. Um, obviously, industry, as you pointed out, have um, put a proposal together in, in the last week. Um, I think for the time being, it's probably something for us, for us in the industry to, to explore. Um, and I, I probably wouldn't really like to sort of give hypothetical arguments here right now. So apologies for that. Um, but again, we, we acknowledge the issue we're trying to look at here. And, you know, we want to try and minimize, um, you know, costs and, and barriers to, to, to sort of, you know, UK reaches as much as we can. It makes sense. And how is the UK expecting to evaluate all the substances registered in the UK reach without access to the ECA database? Yeah, sure, Chad. I mean, that's. I mean, it's a it's a good point. Someone's been talked to, you know, made to us before. Um, you know, we've we've had to make that balance of opinion. You know, we are establishing a new regime um, in in the UK um, because of these these issues with regard to. Um, data, we couldn't ask for industry to provide them to us straight away. I mean, that would just not have been possible for all the reasons we've, we've just been through. Um, so it, it is a balanced view that we will, um, you know, it will take time for us to completely fill up, you know, fill the sort of evidence base we have. And that's where we are. So for, for the moment, um, you know, we will use public available information out there. And of course, we will look at what other regulators are doing. Um, you know, for example, EU. Um, because obviously we've been very closely tied to that recently. So, you know, initially we will have a very close look at close look at what, what they are doing. And then over time, the UK regulatory authority will you know, get more information and we'll be able to do, you know, more, you know, be able to do more of the regulatory work. Okay. Nishma, the approach to only provide full data sets uh, would considerably lower the cost for industry to be on the market in the UK. In case registrants do need to purchase data access via a letter of access, an LOA, should they then pay a hundred percent fee, yeah? equivalent to the notification fees for UK REITs, yeah? resembling the Helsinki fees, or should those fees be discounted? And if so, is there a rule of thumb for the cost sharing mechanism here? So, in terms of um, the data cost, um, it's, it's, it's a good question, Jill. I think it's as for you EU REACH or UK REACH, um, registrants will need the permissions and the rights to refer to data as they did in, in, in EU REACH. In many cases, this data will be held by um, a company or a consortium or a CIF, um, and the lead registrant will need um, sub-license agreements to, to use that data, and the co-registrants, as you say, will need a letter of access to say that they, they have been given permission to, to refer to that data in the registration. So all of those things need, will need to happen under UK reach in some way or, or form. Buying data, of course, it's a commercial transaction and as trade bodies, uh, along with our European Association and, and other national associations, um, we don't dictate how these should take place. What I would say, though, um, and what we've recommended both with our European Association, CEFIC, is that it's recognised that these data packages were brought under EU reach to co also cover the UK market. So one would naturally hope that this would continue um, to be used under under UK reach to some extent without a you know a hundred percent duplication of that charge at the, at the very least. Um, this is something we've advocated with CEFIC, as I say in in some of the guidance material we've put out. But ultimately, as you say, this will be the decision of the data holders. These are commercial transactions, so that's that's one element of the data cost. But of course, the other thing is we also need to look at how the data sharing will work under UK reach as well. So getting the data from EU reach to, to UK reach is, is one issue. The other issue and, and another option, as I mentioned earlier, that we're looking with, with government is, well, how does UK reach functionality allow data sharing across UK registrant holders as well? So that's another option proposal that we're, that we're working alongside um, government with. Okay, thank you. Besides registration, evaluation of chemicals, there's also authorization. 
James, will all authorized substances from EU reach automatically be granted authorization in the UK? And what is the process of adding new chemicals to the UK authorization list? And, and how about substances that are in the process of an EU authorization request? Sure, Chad. Yeah, I mean, authorization is obviously an important part of the process. Um, yeah, so you've kind of asked me three things there. Um, so the first thing is um, you know, all existing GB based. Um, authorizations um, were carried over into much like the registrations it was the same the authorizations they were carried over into um, UK reach on the 1st of January so so they remain uh, valid um, but again similar to registrations those companies um, need to get in get in contact with the authorities it's actually within 60 days so we've only got one week left um, of that deadline um, to provide us with with further information um, about those authorizations um, with regard to how will um, you know how will we add chemicals to the authorization list um, in the future? Um, well, as I said, the EU authorization um, list, so and Annex 14, it was carried over into UK Reach on the 1st of January. So, so as it stands, we have the same sort of authorization list at the moment. Um, what we will do um, as regulators is is we will um, in the next within the next by the end of this year, I should say, um, provide more information. Um, on what our recommendations for the priority substances are um, for for the Annex 14, um, and then from that point forward, then UK regulators will will start to make our own you know our own decisions on on manage, managing that annex. Um, finally, you asked um, about what happens to um, you uh, sorry um, authorization applications. Um, so there's the sort of the best way of describing this is if you had uh, if your authorization hadn't been fully granted by the first of January. Um, however, if your authorization um, had been, um, you know, provided um, to the EU by the by the last application date, uh, and if and if ECHA had provided an an adopt, oh, sorry, ECHA had adopted its final opinions, um, if those if those opinions had been adopted by the EU, um, then for that registrant, um, they could tell the UK authorities, and we would and the UK authorities would pick up that authorization using um, the ECHA recommendation. Um, for the UK purposes, um, if, however, your authorization was in the, was in the position where it didn't um, receive its opinions adopted in the EU before the first of January, then for those companies, they will have to resubmit a full application to UK authorities. Okay, is it feasible that some substances have to be authorized in the EU but can be placed on the UK market without need for authorization? Um, so I should say as well, yes. Yeah, so those um, companies, downstream users um, of EU authorizations, um, they also need to notify um, UK authorities that they are being used in the UK um, by the 60-day deadline. So that's towards the end of February. I was more referring to new substances. So they are not on the EU list yet, but they will be added in future on the EU list, but potentially not end up on a UK list. Um, there is there is potential for that. Um, you know, the, we are we are UK reached now. Um, you know that, that yeah, we can work um, independently. Um, so you know we will we will make those judgments. I'm, I'm sure you know in future we will you know engage closely with with the EU. Um, we will know what what they are thinking about. We will know what they are thinking about. Um, you know, I, I can't say what will or won't happen, um, but there is a possibility there could be differences. Um, I like, but we, we will just have to see how that how that unfolds in time. Okay, uh, Nishma, UK REACH uh, also uses a restriction process to regulate uh, certain dangerous substances. Would more restriction be preferred over the expensive authorization process? I think you have to look at the two process, processes separately and, and what each one is trying to bring. So for me, in a nutshell, the two can't be compared. Their aims and processes are, are, are different. So, for example, with authorization, the burden of proof for continued use is is with industry, essentially. It is a costly process, but it can bridge a gap for some uses until an alternative is, is, is found and available on the market. If you take restriction, on the other hand, um, quite a lot of the, the work or the, the justification to restrict is, is with regulator, with obviously input from stakeholders. It's obviously less costly immediately and directly for, for industry. But in the long term or in, in sort of when the implementation of that restriction takes place, it can happen quite 
quickly um, and obviously that has its own impacts and consequences on on operations and what it means for your supply chains as well so very two different approach approaches to risk management and I think each one has its benefits and and, and cons depending on what the situation what substance it is and what what supply chains and businesses are, are involved okay James can we expect the UK to initiate new restrictions for example on PFAS yeah, I mean, you know, we are commissioned in the UK now to protect, you know, environmental and um, and human health in the UK. Um, so yes, we will look at every sort of you know, look look at chemicals of concern um, across the piece in the UK. Um, PFAS obviously are, you know, they they are a big concern uh, in the environment and a bit a big international focus on those at the moment. Um, so you know, we will look at those in the UK context. Um, and again, you know, in the coming months, we will put out more more firm pr for firm recommendations of what we will do for for restrictions in the UK. Um, but certainly, PFAS is you know, it's it's one of those things that is is of concern, and the UK will be looking at it. And the UK, if they look at PFAS, for instance, are they then looking at PFAS as substances, or are they trying to group it as well, similar to other jurisdictions? Um, Agreed. I mean, there, there are a wide, there are a wide variety of PFAS, aren't there? So gr grouping, I've, we've seen lots of arguments for putting them together. Um, that is what we're looking at at the moment as well. So, you know, no decisions made on how we would tackle it, but I agree that would be an appropriate way you might look at it. Okay. We all know uh, that polymers will be on the menu in Europe soon, in European Union. Um, are they expected to be integrated in UK REACH as well soon? Um, at the moment, um, again, something we are looking at. Um, as I say, with 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 everything, um, you know, the sort of separation from UK and EU, we will keep a close eye on on what the EU are doing. Um, polymers, I know, has been you know discussed for for some time. Um, you know, there are pros and cons about how many other substances you know that brings into uh, into, into range. Um, so again, something we're looking at, um, and uh, I can't say whether we will or we won't at the moment, but it's certainly you know, something we will focus on. Okay, and also nanomaterials. Yeah, so again, nano is another, another interesting one um, because um, obviously the EU um, clarified some of the registration um, sort of requirements last year. Um, so those are part of UK reach um, already. Um, however, some of, the, some of the focus on safety data sheets uh, amendments may have come in um, since January this year. Um, so don't apply in UK reach. So again, something we will look at uh, and may, may well put in place in the UK. Um, but um, you know, just taking some time to look at that in the UK context at the moment. Okay. Nishma, uh, how are poison centre notifications arranged in the UK? I believe they uh, continue as they, they have done in previous years, Jid. So that's uh, sending um, to the National Poison Information Service um, the safety data sheets. Um, um, if you are if you are looking at certain hazardous mixtures and, and placing them on the, on the UK market. Okay, and do you think that um, a, a skip database development, like hey, on the substances of concern in articles at such or in complex objects, should that also be started in the UK? I think the focus on that one should be what that database is trying to achieve. So, from my from my understanding and my knowledge, is that it's trying to increase the knowledge on on chemicals, whether they're in articles and um, in products, or indeed in the, in the in the waste end of the the, the supply chain, if you like. So this is all trying to contribute and support a better circular economy. So I think in looking at that, the UK should look at what is fit for purpose to meet those objectives in trying to you know, increase um, circularity, trying to support those, those ambitions and objectives that they have in the UK in line with, with resource efficiency too. So definitely another initiative that could start in due time. Agree. James, you also agree? Yes, I think, um, I mean, we're probably all well aware of the debates around uh, the, the sort of outcomes and benefits of the SCIP database. Um, yes, not something that automatically comes into into UK uh, context. Again, one of those to look at, okay, well, what is, I think exactly as Nishman said, I mean, what is it trying to achieve and what might be appropriate in the, in the UK context? Um, so I, I don't think we're you know, starting a SCIP data, database very soon, but um, we will look again, something to look at. Okay, final question to both of you. Any last recommendations for industry for the coming period until end of October, when we hopefully can all meet live again in London for Chemcon Europe 2021? 
Sure. Shall I go first? Um, I've, I mean, I would just, for, from, from everyone's perspective, I think, I think the main thing we're focusing on at the moment is registrations and making sure that um, you know, all supply chains are, are maintained for the GB market in and, in and out. Um, so I think, you know, for, I, think, I think the important one here is, is for downstream users and importers um, for both UK-based UK ones and for companies exporting into the EU. Um, I really would recommend that everyone double checks their supply chains um, to make sure that they know if they are exporting to the UK, that um, maybe their importer is taking on the registration duties or vice versa, whether they might need to do something to help out in that space, um, just to make sure we minimize the, minimize any chance of disruption um, in this space. So just recommend all companies check and double check um, their products and their supply chains to make sure they know their registration obligations in, in the UK. So I think as industry, um, our work will continue to support businesses um, in the regulatory impact from the new UK-EU trading relationship. Um, beyond some of the issues we've mentioned today around, around UK reach and some of the, the challenges, I think immediate actions that need to be considered um, on the EU front, looking at those transfer of UK registrations that have already taken place, but for those EU legal entities to then accept those and, of course, pay any uh, relevant fees are, that are applicable to those transfers. On the UK side, James mentioned some of the, the forthcoming deadlines between now and the end of October. So we have one um, at the at the beginning of March um, related to authorizations, of course, and of course those two big registration related deadlines around notifications, both for grandfathered registrations and of course the downstream user import notifications as well. So we have that coming up in, in April and, and October. So I think those are the, the key sort of immediate actions. And of course, if you haven't already um, familiarize yourself with UK Reach IT, um, that's another one to, to make sure that you're, you're, um, you're registered and, and, and have an account that you need to use for notification purposes. Okay, Nishma and James, thank you very much for sharing so many intriguing ingredients of UK Reach. Whether it's an omelette or scrambled eggs, we all know you can't make it without breaking a few eggs. So industry, on your marks, get set, bake.